Okay, in this chapter, which is chapter two of your textbook, we'll go through some of the main points regarding ethics and professional responsibility. We'll bring in some Florida law. Um, look how Florida regulates members of the bar to some degree and um, how that impacts paralegals in their day-to-day -day jobs. One thing to cover first is the fact that we have a number of different things that kind of control us within society and in our own lives, a personal moral code, um, ethics, and the law itself. And these things sometimes converge and run parallel or side by side, but at other times there are some stark contrasts. You can think of folks who morally are opposed to gambling or drink, drinking alcohol or abortion. Well, your moral code may keep you from participating in those activities, doing those things, but the law has legalized such activities and controls and, and restrains within society what folks can and cannot do. Codes of ethics often coincide with a profession, an organization that is regulating members where it is a privilege to participate in a job or to have some status through membership. Within the United States, we have separate bar associations that regulate the practice of law. So there are 50 state bar associations who all using model rules um, handed down from the ABA or approved by the ABA, the American Bar Association, regulate lawyers. Um, as lawyers are regulated, so are the law firms, the employees, the paralegals, everyone that falls under the direct supervision of lawyers. So within this field, there are layers of regulation. You have the bar association. We'll also look at common law issues um, in the area of agency law, state statutes that impact lawyers and their law firms, and also contract law um, between attorneys and their clients. We won't go over every single one of these chapters um, in detail. We just want to realize how in-depth the rules regulating the Florida Bar are. Um, you can find all of these rules online through the Florida Bar website and go into the individual chapters to look at such things as the bylaws of the Bar, discipline of attorneys, the rules of professional conduct, and very specific rules on regulating trust accounts, um, factors that come into regulating specialized education programs, the security funds of clients, referral programs, legal service plans, uh, rules governing the investigation and prosecutions of UPL, which is the unlicensed practice of law, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Rules governing the law school practice program, which allows third-year law students um, to enter a program called uh, the Certified Legal Internship Program and actually appear in court. So there's a chapter dealing with that. Um, pro bono practice for attorneys who, uh, who volunteer, legal aid practitioners, grievance mediation, fee arbitration between lawyers and clients. There's an entire chapter on how lawyers advertise, as well as an entire chapter on foreign legal consultants. Chapter 17 deals with in-house counsel provisions. Chapter 18, military legal assistance. Chapter 19, the state center for professionalism. And finally, in chapter 20, you see the rules pertaining to Florida's registered paralegal program. One very important rule in the state of Florida is 4-5.3, the responsibilities regarding non-lawyer assistance. 
and titles that are used. So this rule reads, a person who uses the title of paralegal, legal assistant, or other similar term when offering or providing services to the public must work for or under the direction or supervision of a lawyer or law firm. So we see within the state of Florida, like most states, paralegals must work directly under the supervision of a lawyer or a law firm. Even if they are working as contract or temp paralegals during short durations of time, there must be a supervising attorney or law firm they can turn to when issues of substantive law and making legal decisions come into the equation with the client. Um, 4-5.3 has responsibilities regarding non-lawyer assistance. So this rule highlights the supervisor's responsibility um, vis-a-vis paralegals. Lawyers must assure that non-lawyer conduct is compatible with the professional obligations of the lawyer. So your supervising attorney, the partner, whoever's in your firm supervising you is directly responsible for your conduct. They're professionally responsible for any misconduct of non-lawyers under their supervision under most circumstances. So if the paralegal or legal assistant is working within the scope of their job duties at a firm and should be supervised by the attorney and something happens that falls within the area of misconduct or there are allegations of misconduct, the lawyer is going to have to answer for those and may be held responsible. The ultimate responsibility is with the lawyer. Under these rules, the lawyer has the obligation of reviewing and being responsible for the work product of all paralegals and legal assistants under their supervision. Now, leaving the actual rules that have been codified by the Florida Bar, we can turn back and look at agency relationships under the law and see that even if those regulations of the Florida Bar didn't exist, we have centuries of common law that would bind lawyers and their responsibility um, in terms of the work that paralegals do and the impact it has on clients um, through these agency relationships. So an agency relationship, which you'll learn a lot about in business organizations, is created either expressly or implied in contract. And this occurs when one party called the principal gives authority or delegates power to do certain things to another person called the agent, attorney, proxy, or delegate. So one example of this that's outside of um, a legal example would be a realtor. We know that realtors represent clients in the buying or selling their home. They've signed a contract with the home buyer or home seller to do certain things to sell or buy a home for an individual. When that transaction is over, the principal um, no longer needs the agent, and the agent no longer needs to have any power to do anything in terms of buying or selling a property. So in the context of a lawyer-client relationship, the client is the principal and the agent is the attorney. Uh, the paralegal, therefore, is really a sub-agent of the client under the attorney. So with agency liability, there are a couple of big concerns. Um, agency actions can transfer liability to the principal under the legal concept of respondeat superior or let the master answer. So even without codified rules in a state bar um, program, an agency relationship exists between a lawyer and a client, and anything the lawyer's employees do, the lawyer is responsible for, and liability may attach. They may have to pay damages or answer for any civil wrongs. Some big areas of concern with professional responsibility and ethics as they pertain to paralegals 
um, include the unlicensed practice of law. The Florida Bar investigates UPL throughout the state in which it has jurisdiction. So each circuit, and there are 20 circuits in Florida, has a UPL committee. They investigate any time a citizen is making a charge against an unlicensed person, a paralegal, um, someone in, in the community holding themselves out as a lawyer. They in investigate those charges and can forward those to the state attorney's office. There are criminal penalties in the state of Florida, state of Florida for practicing law without a license. So in Florida, it is a third-degree felony, punishable by up to five years in prison and a $5,000 fine. Um, there are people throughout the state that are prosecuted under this law every year. Um, through a little bit of research, you can see that often prison sentences are between one and two years. Sometimes they are suspended. But the fine of $5,000 is typically always put in place. And, of course, it is a felony. So it is a serious charge to have levied against you. How do folks get in trouble with UPL? There are a couple big things that can occur that look like the unpracticed, unlicensed practice of law or, frankly, are the unlicensed practice of law. So the big one is holding oneself out as an attorney. Anytime someone says that they are a practicing attorney within the state of Florida, and they do not have a bar number for the state and are authorized to practice in the state, they are not truly an attorney within the state of Florida. Giving legal advice. Anyone who gives legal advice to another person who then relies on that legal advice to their detriment and makes a decision that has legal impact is going to have a major, major problem. He says, that is against the law. We cannot answer substantive questions as paralegals. We only assist the lawyer in determining how to make the substantive decisions. Even something like selecting forms in Florida can lead to UPL situations. There are forms that have been approved by the Supreme Court for pro se clients meaning clients doing legal work on their own, so filing their own divorce, defending their own foreclosure. It's acceptable to, to assist people in filling out those forms. But what paralegals cannot do is meet with a client, let's say a client who's trying to determine what type of business to form, and provide that client with the necessary forms to create an LLC, a limited liability company, or a limited partnership, or a S-Corp, and make decisions to determine which type of legal entity they should form, and then assist the client in filling out those forms, because that is substantive legal advice. And then, of course, representing clients. Paralegals cannot um, appear before a tribunal, which means in a court, where there is a judge or a general magistrate or any official hearing where witnesses are sworn in. There are a few exceptions to this rule with federal administrative law, and we'll get to those in a latter chapter, where non-lawyers may appear with a client, but that area is strictly um, regulated and a very, very narrow area. So how do we keep from... Um, being accused of the crime of UPL, uh, we can be punished for in the state of Florida by a fine of up to $5,000 and incarceration up to five years in prison. These are the big things right here. Don't give legal advice. Don't hold yourself out as a lawyer. Don't complete forms. Don't represent clients. Um, the holding oneself out as a lawyer, uh, one thing I did not mention in the previous slide, but just be aware of, is to make sure that your email signature and the letterhead that your firm uses clearly identifies you as a paralegal. So clients or prospective clients are not confused as to your status within the firm.
We've spoke about this a little bit earlier, but it, it bears repeating. Um, but attorneys follow state rules. If attorneys are barred in multiple states, then multiple rules will govern their behavior. Um, in modern American legal practice, most states have adopted the American Bar Association's model rules. The language may look a little bit different and the rules may be structured in a different way depending on what state um, um, you're looking at. But the substance of the rules, um, the heart of the ethical gui guidelines is always very, very similar. So the states have adopted those model rules and um, to give them the force of law, state Supreme Courts then codify those into their regulations. All law firms, all law firm employees must follow these. So when you think about what guidelines are going to direct your behavior, you will have the ABA guidelines because attorneys and their employees must follow those. Um, if you're a certified or registered paralegal, there are ethics codes for paralegals. Um, NALA um, is a good resource, the National Association of Legal Assistants, for seeing an ethical code. And then state rules governing all types of conduct in a commercial setting and context. Within a, an attorney's firm, there can be administrative assistants, paralegals, consultants, I don't have it on this slide, but other experts, even folks that do things such as IT um, and, and run the, the business end of the firm, all fall within the attorney's ethical obligation to supervise. Another area where there can be professional responsibility issues has to deal with competence. Lawyers and their paralegals, in order to represent a client appropriately and zealously, must be thorough, must be prepared, must have the appropriate legal knowledge and skills in that area of the law. So attorneys who practice primarily in family law and never handle criminal defense matters would need to give a referral to that prospective client, to another attorney to handle the case. Because they may not possess the legal knowledge and skill in the area of criminal law. Now perhaps they do both. They handle divorces and DUI cases. But a prospective client walks to the door who's charged with murder. Now they may have to make the decision just because they handle certain types of criminal cases, do they necessarily possess the skill and legal knowledge to handle a murder case? They're always very thorough and prepared in their divorce cases and their DUI cases, but is that alone enough to show competence? Most jurisdictions would say no. You need the skill and legal knowledge as well as being well prepared thorough and smart. Confidentiality is a major, major legal and ethical obligation. We need to keep communications with clients confidential. Privilege is something that goes beyond an ethics rule and is actually an evidentiary rule. So the shield of privilege protects certain types of communications from being disclosed at trial or really disclosed at any time that could lead to trial. Unfortunately, there are times where because of haste, um, because of the amount of information going through the law firm or just simply because of mistake, lawyers, paralegals, and law firms inadvertently disclose information that should be privileged, um, often privileged through the work product doctrine, which we'll talk about. So what happens if confidential info is disclosed to opposing counsels by mistake? 
Well, jurisdictions handle this in different ways. There are places around the country where inadvertent disclosure is automatic waiver, meaning there is no longer privilege attached to whatever you have disclosed. There are other states that say there is no waiver, meaning you have not waived privilege. The communications are still confidential, and whatever has been disclosed needs to be returned. And then there are other jurisdictions, including the federal courts, that have a balancing test where they look at a number of factors to determine whether a waiver should occur or not. How does Florida handle inadvertent disclosures? So assertion of privilege as to inadvertently disclose materials. Um, any party, person, or entity after inadvertent disclosure of any materials pursuant to these rules may thereafter assert any privilege recognized by law as to those materials. So you can petition the court after inadvertently disclosing and say, hey, we need this stuff back. It can't be used. It was inadvertently disclosed. This right exists without regard to whether the disclosure was made pursuant to formal demand or informal request. Meaning it does not matter if the inadvertent disclosure occurred during the discovery process or if it accidentally went out with a random email or letter to the other firm. In order to assert the privilege, the party, person, or entity shall have within 10 days of actually discovering the inadvertent disclosure, serve written notice of the assertion of privilege on the party to whom the materials were disclosed. So in order to get your material back, you must serve upon the party written notice that that material is privileged. And you only have 10 days from the point of discovering to do that. The notice shall specify with particularity the materials as to which the privilege is asserted, the nature of the privilege asserted, and the date on which the inadvertent disclosure was actually discovered. When this happens, there's a duty to the other party that has received notice and that's holding the materials. A party receiving notice of an assertion of privilege shall promptly return, sequester, or destroy the materials specified in the notice, as well as any copies of the material. The party receiving the notice shall also promptly notify any other party, person, or entity to, to, to whom it has disclosed the materials of fact that the notice has been served. So they have a responsibility to control the dissemination material, to return it, or if need be, destroy it, and not use the material in an adverse way. However, the other party can challenge the assertion that the disclosure is privileged. Any party receiving that notice has the right to challenge the assertion of privilege. The grounds for the challenge may include, but are not limited to, the following. Um, the materials in question are not privileged. The disclosing party, person, or entity lacks standing to assert the privilege. The disclosing party, person, or entity has failed to serve timely notice under this rule. The circumstances surrounding the production or disclosure of the materials warrant a finding that the disclosing party, person, or entity has waived its assertion that the material is protected by a privilege. So we have a number of ways that the privilege assertion can be challenged, that it's simply not privileged material, that the person that's challenging it and saying that it is lacks standing, meaning it's not their material. Um, three, that they failed to serve timely notice. They did not um, fall within that 10-day window. Um, or the circumstances surrounding the production um, has been waived through other additional um, um, examples or reasons. So for privilege, privilege to apply, client must keep information secret. A client may always destroy privilege. It's their case. It's their situation. It's their information. 
that they want to bring their best friend into the meeting um, with the attorney and the paralegal, they may do so, but they've destroyed privilege at this point. They're the only ones that can waive it. It is their privilege. So a lawyer cannot waive privilege between herself or himself and a client. Under the law, we've had privilege scenarios for centuries. Some of you have probably heard of spousal privilege. Um, there's also privilege with, um, um, within religion, uh, religious orders and with clergy. So what you tell a priest or a rabbi. Uh, medical privilege, when you meet with a doctor or a nurse, um, that's privileged communication. We also see privilege established by contract. So in a settlement agreement where you agree not to disclose the terms and conditions of the settlement. Um, and also privilege established by law. You, you enter the military, you receive a security clearance, you have information that is privileged or classified that will not be disclosed. Along with that is the work product doctrine. So this protects materials created by the lawyer or the law firm on behalf of a client in anticipation of litigation. So when a client is working on it, or when a lawyer rather, is working on a client's case and it looks like something is going to be litigated or could be litigated down the road, the documents they create and share with their client are privileged through the work product doctrine. However, this doctrine does not protect things that are prepared in the normal course of business. So if you have your sales records, your, your financial documents, your tax records for your business, things that are just typical business records, and you provide those to your attorney, and they, they, put, they keep those at their firm, those are not work product documents, and they're not pr protected. The information may be used in litigation, but they weren't created for the purposes of litigation. And that's the difference. Another big ethical um, area is conflict of interest. So there are times when clients come in and a firm cannot represent them because of their history with the client or because of the clients they currently represent. So think about situations where a firm represents a husband in a divorce, and then years later, a wife comes in and wants to be represented in her next divorce. The firm has a conflict. They've gone against the wife in a previous divorce, and the law says that's a conflict. There are certain situations where the client can waive that conflict, but often for firms, it's not prudent to allow that to happen. If there's any even chance that a conflict may exist, you do not re represent the client. Another example would be a patient and a doctor in a medical malpractice case. So you represent a patient in particular legal matters. Now the patient is suing a doctor for medical malpractice. The doctor comes to your firm to defend him from the allegations. There's a conflict of interest there. Or how about a discharged employee and an employer in a wrongful discharge case? Your, your firm handles maybe real estate and contract matters for a business. Your firm also has a division that does employee law. An employee comes in and wants to file a lawsuit against the employer you represent in other areas. Conflict of interest. Firms will always check for conflicts during the intake of a client. It's one of the first things you need to investigate. You need to know the client's full legal name or the, what the name of the business is that they're um, representing, the name of the corporation, the legal status, so you can research to see if your firm has ever represented anyone in an adverse proceeding against them in the past. Um, additional area of the ethical universe is candor and fairness. 
And there's a lot of jokes about lawyers lying and this idea that lawyers lie all the time. I know very few good lawyers that lie. That's just the reality of it. With the movies and television and the media represents about the legal profession is often very different than what you find in practice. The majority of lawyers are ethical or they wouldn't have clients. Um, candor, not only to their clients, but candor to the court is extremely important. Fairness, honesty, and mutual respect. These factors make up the core of candor and fairness. There are situations where attorneys, of course, we have 100,000 attorneys in the state of Florida, violate these areas of candor and fairness. And they're often reported to the Florida Bar for ethical violations. So what are some of these big ethical pitfalls? A stumbling into a lawyer-client relationship. So when a client meets with a firm, an attorney or paralegal, and believes that that lawyer is now representing them, even though a retainer letter has not been signed, and money has not changed hands. This is a problematic situation. Firms need to make it clear if they're going to represent a client. If they're not going to represent a client, they need to still send a letter communicating that they are not going to take the case, perhaps give a referral to a lawyer who may be able to take the case, and let the client know that they are not engaged in a lawyer-client relationship. So you want to be very clear in writing that you do not represent someone. Oh, the, the boss made me do it, ethical trap. I was just following orders. We need to report all violations, even if it may hurt you in the short term. Um, if someone in your firm is violating the, the codes of conduct and professional responsibility, you need to report it to human resources or your supervising attorney. If your supervising attorney is violating the rules of professional conduct and responsibility, rules of the Florida Bar, there is a Florida Bar hotline that you may call to report misconduct. The first level of contact with that hotline is actually anonymous. So you can get advice on how to handle ethical situations within the state of Florida. Communicating by email. This can be an ethical trap. Um, you need to label messages appropri appropriately. Make sure only folks that need to be on the email receive the email. Make sure that no confidential information is sent via email if other parties, third parties, may be exposed to the email. You know, really draft every email as, as if you would not mind it being read openly in the court. We also are sure not to give legal conclusions or legal advice via email. Oh, failure to communicate with clients. So typically when clients accuse lawyers and law firms of malpractice, one of the first issues comes up in their complaint is the fact they failed to communicate with the client. So we need to initiate communication and, and, and make sure that at different occasions we clearly cl communicate what's going on. And here are the times where we really need to make sure um, situations are communicated. One, when decisions require client consent about the objectives of representation, such as a decision to settle a case or appeal a case that needs to be communicated in writing. When seeking a waiver of a client fiduciary obligation, um, also confidentiality and conflicts of interest. Anytime you're going to ask a client to waive a right or give up money, it needs to be in writing. When decisions require client consent about the means to be used to accomplish client objectives, such as whether to litigate, you know, go all the way to trial, arbitrate or mediate a matter, so use alternative dispute resolution, or whether to stipulate to a set of facts. When clients should be updated on the status of a matter, 
especially information about developments and the represent, representation itself, such as a serious illness of the lawyer or merger with another firm. So these very substantive matters must be dis disclosed. When the client requests information, the client's file is their property. When they request something out of the file, it needs to be provided to them in a timely manner. When the client expects assistance, the lawyer cannot pro provide um, such as counsel in committing crimes. So if you have a client looking to do something illegal, the lawyer and law firm need to directly communicate to the client that they will not be involved in any way, shape, or form with that activity. Those are the major areas of communication that always must be presented to a client. All right, so that covers the main points in Chapter 2. Uh, hopefully you found this presentation useful. If you have any questions, um, please um, shoot me an email, and I can always do a follow-up video um, discussing anything that you have an issue with. Um, thanks for watching.